Your pomp has been brought down to Sheol, along with the music of your harps. Maggots are your bed, and worms your blanket. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, O destroyer of nations. Isaiah, chapter 14. That was Venus. Nothing but nothing. Except it scared me. It was like circling a haunted house in the middle of deep space. I know how unscientific that sounds, but I was scared gutless until we got out of there. I think if our rockets hadn't gone off, I would have cut my throat on the way down. Maybe it's a good thing that the cloud cover is there. It's like a skull that's been picked clean. That's the closest I can get. Stephen King, I am the doorway. In 2015, Michael Santini, an aerospace engineer turned evangelical pastor, claimed to have found hell. Not in the mind, nor in some ethereal other world, nor even in other people. No, hell, the realm of fire and sulfur, destination for the souls of the wicked, was a material, physical location within our universe. Within our very backyard. Not beneath us, but above us. For much of the year, its glow enlivens our evenings and early mornings. We often mistake it for a star, or even a UFO, but it is a planet, and a planet that, for the most part, we appear to have forgotten. For much of the last century, Mars, with its familiar arroyos and canyons and frequent visits from the neighbors, has played the role of our sister planet, but it is not. Our true sister, our closest planet, not only in distance but also in mass and composition, has long been forsaken to the outskirts of our minds, even as she remains the one star most of us still notice. After the sun and the moon, she is the brightest object in our skies. On moonless nights, out of the corner of your eye, you might even catch her casting ephemeral, ghostly shadows. Over the years, she has gone by many names. Ishtar, Vesper, Phosphorus, Lucifer. Poets have sung of her golden radiance, even as they encanted fearful epics of her dark journey through the cosmos. Today, if she is thought of at all, it is as a world gone wrong, a twisted parody of Earth brought across the veil as a seething, choked nightmare that could well serve as a prison for the damned. Welcome to Venus, the world so beautiful we named the devil after it. We have known Venus for as long as we have been human, and for as long as we have known her, she has deceived us. Nearly every culture has enveloped her in cloaks of myth. For the Yongu Aborigines, she is Barnumbir, the light who guided the first humans to Australia. For the Maasai, she is Kiliken, a radiant boy who came to Earth to aid a cowherd, but fled back to the sky when his trust was betrayed. But for all of that history, Venus has striven to conceal her true nature. While she is the first and indeed only planet known to all human cultures, she presents herself not as a single entity, but two. For nine months, in the last wisp of night, she makes a wild dance heralding the sun's rise, and is called the Morning Star. Then, for about two months, she seems to disappear below the earth, and then reappear on the other side, for a further nine months as the Evening Star. Her gyration is now chasing the sun's setting. If you ever wished upon the first star you saw at night, it was probably Venus. Then, for a further eight days, she disappears again, before the cycle begins anew. This twice-nine-month cycle, called Venus's synodic period, 
is suggested by some as the reason many cultures, though not all, have seen her as female. While all cultures have watched the motions of the morning star and evening star, not all have seen through her guise and realized they are one. The deduction that the morning and evening stars are in fact one and the same is the first astronomical discovery, and arguably the first scientific discovery, many cultures make, though whether they do appears utterly unrelated to their supposed technological sophistication. While many so-called great civilizations, such as the Babylonians, the Chinese, the Indians, and the Mesoamericans, made that connection, many others, such as the Greeks, Romans, and Vietnamese, did not. Conversely, many supposedly primitive cultures, such as the Maasai and the Polynesians, saw Venus for who she was. We don't precisely know what culture was the first to make the deductive jump. Our earliest solid evidence, as with nearly all the most ancient astronomy, comes from Babylon, and the Venus tablet of Amisaducha, dated to roughly 1700 BC. But the Babylonians consider themselves the daughter culture of the Sumerians, the first civilization ever to exist. And while there is scant evidence of a planetary theory in the Sumerian corpus, one of their myths may be a metaphorical account of Venus's errant motions through the sky, and also the earliest record of an ancient mythic tradition tying Venus to both beauty and violence. It is a misconception that Venus was only ever seen as an object of beauty before the eyes of mankind peered beneath her veil. From the beginning, her mythic cloak was stained with blood. As I said, the Greeks and Romans did not see through Venus's dual identity themselves. The Romans learned the truth from the Greeks, and the Greeks learned it from the Babylonians. To the Greeks, Venus was Phosphorus, the light bringer, in the morning, or Hesperus, the evening bringer. The Romans translated Phosphorus as Lucifer, and Hesperus as Vesper. But those names would soon be left to the side, as a new and unnerving goddess made her sinuous way across the sea. She was romantic and passionate, yet also capricious and vengeful. Aphrodite, as the Greeks called her, her Latin name, Venus, was originally a native Roman goddess with a similar portfolio, was not native to their world, but it arrived from the east as Astarte, or Astoreth a forbidding Phoenician goddess not only of sexuality and fertility, but of war. Her arrival likely formed part of the same interchange that gave the Greeks the Phoenicians' most useful tool, the alphabet. The Phoenicians were also likely the Greeks' first connection to Babylon, and their vast body of astronomical knowledge. The Babylonians were the first culture we know of to develop a comprehensive planetary theory, it is from their meticulous records, via the Greeks, that Western astronomy ultimately derives. The Babylonians mapped and plotted the motions of the five planets visible to the naked eye, which they named after their gods. The planet they named for Marduk, their supreme god, entered the Greek world as Zeus, and then became Jupiter. The planet named for their god of war, Nergal, the Greeks named Ares, which then became Mars. And of course, the planet we now call Venus was initially named for the Babylonian goddess of love and sexual desire. Like the Phoenicians, the Babylonians were a Semitic culture and so worshipped a similar pantheon of deities. To the Babylonians, Astarta was Ishtar, a goddess of sexual behavior, particularly infidelity, but also of blood and conquest. Ishtar incarnate as the unified morning and evening star, stood beside kings in the rage of the battlefield, which was called the Playground of Ishtar. Like Venus, Ishtar was a local Babylonian god whose myths were fused with that of an earlier goddess, the Sumerian Inanna. Inanna oversaw divine justice, or at least her own, with fearsome efficiency. The Sumerians made no bones about her character. Goddess of the fearsome divine powers, clad in terror, riding on the great divine powers, Inanna, 
drenched in blood, rushing around in great battles, with shield resting on the ground, covered in storm and flood. Not behavior commonly associated with a sex goddess. This association with death is likely tied to her best-known exploit, her descent into the underworld. In the story, Inanna forsakes her godly duties and descends into the underworld, the place of no return, because, she explains after hammering on the door, the husband of her sister, the Queen of the Dead, has died and she expects to get lots of wine at his wake. Well, people have certainly done more for less. In the Babylonian version, Ishtar says, If you do not open the gate for me to come in, I shall smash the doorpost and overturn the doors. I shall raise up the dead, and they shall eat the living, and the dead shall outnumber the living. This is no idle threat. She repeats it verbatim to Gilgamesh when he spurns her advances. Apparently, starting a zombie apocalypse was just something the goddess of love did. After passing through the underworld's seven gates and removing her clothing, she is allowed to see her sister, whom she immediately throws off her throne so she can sit on it. The seven judges of the dead don't take to this and punish Inanna for her hubris. The, the afflicted woman, woman was, was turned, turned into a corpse, a corpse and the, the corpse, corpse was hung on a hook. Inanna appeals to members of her godly family, but they all remind her that the underworld is, you know, the place of no return. Eventually, her father Enki sends two sexless envoys who lead her out in exchange for her husband, Demuzi, whom Inanna lets be taken after he failed to show proper mourning. More than a few scholars have noted the similarity between Ishtar slash Inanna's descent and return from the underworld, and her namesake planet's seeming descent and return from the depths of the Earth. Did this mean the Sumerians were aware that Venus was a single planet? Perhaps, but more important is the spread of this awareness across the Semitic world, eventually arriving in the Hebrew Bible. In the quote at the start of this video, the prophet Isaiah is comparing the death of the king of Babylon to the fall of the morning star beneath the earth, but later Christian writers would employ Isaiah's description of Lucifer's fall as a metaphor, and later not so metaphor, for Satan's fall from heaven and descent into hell. And thus was the innocuous name Lucifer forever tied to that of the adversary of God. By the way, and completely coincidentally, over the course of eight years, the motion of Venus as observed from Earth creates a pattern resembling a five-petaled inverted flower, known as the pentagram of Venus. And that, for much of human history, was the sum of Venus. Knowledge of the planet and the cults it inspired would gradually grow over the succeeding centuries. When the conquistadores arrived in Mexico, they found that the Aztecs, in a striking case of cultural parallelism, also saw Venus as a war god who descended into the underworld, though of course, their Venus, who was male, was appeased with human sacrifice. And then, in 1610, Venus changed everything. Like a latter-day Prometheus, its fire would descend to Earth and ignite what would become the scientific revolution. That year, Galileo Galilei, observing Venus through his self-built telescope, made the one discovery for which he could never be challenged. Venus, like the moon, has phases. As it approaches Earth, growing brighter in our sky, its disk becomes ever more enveloped in shadow, so that, in yet another deception, it was actually at its least visible when appearing brightest to her eyes. Even the most meagerly educated clerk of the Inquisition understood what that meant. Venus orbited the sun, and if Venus orbited the sun, Mercury must as well. For the first time in over a thousand years, the settled, comfortable view of the cosmos would have to be overturned. That said, as anyone even remotely familiar with the life of Galileo knows, it wouldn't lead to acceptance of Earth's motion around the sun. Rather, an ingenious, if cumbersome, compromise was developed by the scientific revolutionary and mad sorcerer Tycho Brahe, in which the Earth retained its central position, with the moon in orbit around it, but all other planets orbited the sun. 
which in turn orbited the Earth. Believe it or not, this model accounted for all the observed motions of the Sun, Moon, and planets, as well as the previous one. It would take the rise of Isaac Newton, and the return of a little comet named Halley, to finally convince humanity that the Earth moved. Even as telescopes exponentially multiplied the power of our eyes, Venus continued in her deception, ever dancing and weaving her veils of shadow. In 1643, Italian Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Battista Riccioli identified what he called an ashen light, a faint grayish glow illuminating Venus's dark side. Over the following centuries, many other astronomers would repeat Riccioli's observation, though no one could confirm it absolutely. To date, it has never been photographed or recorded. Hypotheses for the origin of the light over the years have included forest fires, city lights, or that most persistent of Venusian deceptions, lightning. A recent hypothesis suggests the light may be due to aurorae created by the ionization of oxygen in Venus's atmosphere by the solar wind. Though this has been criticized as there's not nearly enough oxygen in Venus's atmosphere to generate aurorae bright enough. In 2015, a particularly favorable occultation of Venus by the Moon offered a rare chance to finally catch ashen light. It was not seen, and there is a growing murmur among the planetarily minded that the ashen light may be no more real than the Martian canals. Japan's Akatsuki spacecraft, currently orbiting Venus, has a camera specifically designed to find lightning and the ashen light. After five years, it has yet to find either. Venus guards her secrets far more fiercely than Mars, and will likely be many years before the ashen light is finally either observed or put out for good. The acceptance of the Earth's motion around the Sun led to an obvious question. If the Earth, with its wind, water, and life, were merely a planet in orbit around the Sun, then might not the other planets be Earths in their own right? Might they also possess those qualities we had so long believed unique to our world? The first hint that this might be true was observed in 1761 by Russian wunderkind Mikhail Lomonosov. Poet, linguist, historian, geologist, geographer, chemist, physicist, and of course, astronomer, Lomonosov left a profound mark on nearly every branch of inquiry. Perhaps his most profound discovery was the law of conservation of mass, which effectively transformed chemistry into a science. But as an astronomer, his greatest observation came during that rarest of rare cosmic events, a transit of Venus, when the disk of Venus crosses that of the Sun. Such are the hidden intricacies of planetary motion that such events only occur about once a century, in pairs eight years apart. The 1761 transit was particularly anticipated because, by measuring its timing from multiple points across the Earth, it would be finally possible to determine the absolute distance between the Earth and the Sun, and thus the size of the solar system itself. That project was successful. But of all the astronomers keeping a watchful eye on Venus, none saw what Lomonosov did. As Venus gradually left the disk of the Sun, it appeared, for a moment, to flare against the black, as if illumined by a ring of fire. Lomonosov immediately grasped what this meant. Venus, like Earth, had an atmosphere, and one substantial enough to be seen across the vastness of space. This discovery lit a fire in the minds of scientists, philosophers, and eventually science fiction writers. It rekindled the ancient idea of cosmic pluralism, that all worlds should be home to life, as there was no other reason for them to exist. But Venus was not about to loosen her petticoats. By the late 19th century, Mars was already mapped and charted, but Venus, swathed in her cloak of clouds, remained an infuriating blank. Despite being closer to Earth than Mars, and far brighter, Venus betrayed not even the broadest outline of her surface features. Terra incognitae are candy to speculative thinkers, and soon imaginative writers from both science and fantasy were weaving wild worlds under those all-concealing clouds. Clouds, obviously, meant water, 
and water meant constant rain. Perhaps Venus was an ocean world, or a tropical jungle home to an intelligent civilization, as imagined by Edgar Rice Burroughs in the 1930s. Though, in 1918, Savante Arrhenius, the Nobel Prize-winning Swedish physicist, poured scorn on such outlandish fancies. Venus couldn't possibly be home to intelligence because, quote, the constantly uniform climatic conditions which exist everywhere result in an entire absence of adaptation to changing exterior conditions. Only low forms of life are therefore represented, mostly, no doubt, belonging to the vegetable kingdom, and the organisms are nearly all of the same kind all over the planet. Unquote. Eventually, when carbon dioxide was identified as a major component of Venus's atmosphere, the idea of a primeval swamp or global ocean began to fade, since carbon dioxide dissolves in water, and the vision of Venus as a vast, arid desert began to take hold. Sir Fred Hoyle, always one to look for dragons, even imagined that Venus might have a surface covered in hydrocarbons, which, while it ultimately failed as a description for Venus, would perfectly describe what lay under the solar system's last impenetrable atmosphere, Saturn's moon Titan. Fred Whipple attempted to save Venus's aquatic blushes by suggesting its ocean was carbonated, like seltzer water. In 1961, the year the Soviet Union launched the first ever spacecraft to Venus, Carl Sagan joked that, quote, Those planning eventual manned expeditions to Venus must be exceedingly perplexed over whether to send along a paleobotanist, a mineralogist, a petroleum geologist, or a deep-sea diver. In the same paper, Sagan would go on to pour cold water, if you'll pardon the expression, on those imagined wonderlands. Observations of Venus in the microwave spectrum had revealed an ambient temperature of 600 kelvins, or over 300 degrees Celsius. There were only two explanations for this finding. Either Venus's magnetosphere was powerful enough to drive ions to that temperature, or Venus simply was that hot. The truth would be darker, and more alien, than Sagan's bleakest predictions. Science, said H.P. Lovecraft, has, quote, hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Unquote. I've never been one to credit Lovecraft's pantophobic paranoia. I would argue that, since he wrote those words in 1926, science's expansion of reality has mostly been met with wonder, or, at worst, indifference. But it is hard not to think of his warning when recounting the frankly heroic attempts mainly by the Soviet Union, to finally force Venus to give up her secrets. When Mikhail Lomonosov discovered Venus's atmosphere in 1761, he unwittingly began a long and strenuous relationship between his country and the second planet. For over a quarter of a century, from 1961 until 1987, the Soviet Union would engage in a spirited lover's quarrel with the fickle goddess, sending 25 probes each time pushing back as she lashed out, and they slowly comprehended the full force of her power. To date, the USSR remains the only nation to ever successfully place landers on the Venusian surface. That, by the way, is what Dmitry Rogozin, head of Russia's space agency, meant when he said in September that Venus had, quote, always been a Russian planet. He wasn't even hinting at a territorial claim, there are many reasons to be mindful of Russia at present. Let's not make up new ones. Russia came late to the planetary exploration party. Their first successful Venus probe, Venera 4, was their tenth attempt. This allowed NASA to earn the laurel when their Venus probe, Pioneer 2, became the first craft ever to fly by another planet. But Venera 4 would not only fly by the planet, but would launch a probe directly into Venus's atmosphere. A 400-kilo first kiss, as it were. Like any tentative lover, the Soviets were touchingly naive. Expecting the probe to land in an ocean, they had rigged the detachable antenna to a lump of sugar that would dissolve when immersed in water. It's fair to say they didn't need it. 
At 15 atmospheres and 25 kilometers from the surface, the first ever transmission from another planet abruptly ceased. If Venus could smile, I imagine she would have. Venera 4 died gracefully as its battery lost power. Venera's 5 and 6, on the other hand, imploded 18 kilometers from the surface under the crushing weight of the Venusian air, which Venera 4 had already determined was 96% carbon dioxide and 4% nitrogen, with the rest measured in parts per million. The Soviets decided that their safest option was to proof future probes to 150 atmospheres. During one test, the engineer opened the Venus simulator to find that the probe was gone. After a moment, he realized that it had not vanished. It was oozing over the floor, only its camera lenses intact, staring blankly up at him like lifeless eyes. And then, in 1970, Venera 7 reached the surface intact, surviving for a full 23 minutes. In that time, it recorded a surface pressure of 93 atmospheres, equivalent to nearly a kilometer beneath Earth's ocean, and a surface temperature of 475 degrees Celsius. Incidentally, that is higher than the boiling point of sulfur, and since the best description of hell in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, describes it as a lake of fire and burning brimstone, assuming the lake is at Earth's surface air pressure, Venus is literally hotter than hell. Of course, sulfur would not boil in the leaden depths of Venus's atmosphere, which for its first seven kilometers is pressurized into an alien liquid. This means that, at the surface at least, Venus's lower atmosphere is better imagined as a global superheated ocean of liquid carbon dioxide seven kilometers deep. Half again as deep as the average for Earth's ocean. Wind effectively does not exist on the surface of Venus. The motion of the air is more akin to an ocean's swell, and much like our own ocean floor, the surface of Venus is isothermal. Day or night, equator to poles, it retains the same endless searing heat. This is partly because, unlike Earth, Venus has virtually no axial tilt. It faces the sun straight on, meaning that it possesses no discernible seasons. The reason for Venus's blast furnace climate was realized even after the first radar measurements of its temperature. Obviously, Venus is closer to the sun than Earth. However, its surface temperature is higher than that of Mercury. Also, its complete cloud cover means that only 25% of the sunlight hitting it reaches the surface, which is less than Earth receives in real terms. No, I'm afraid the true reason is one well known to us today. The greenhouse effect. For decades, scientists have been warning us of the dangers of increased carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and now, with worldwide brush fires, war-igniting droughts, and a fairly cynical scramble for previously inaccessible Arctic territory, we are finally beginning to see the effects play out. But all this chaos is the result of an increase in atmospheric CO2 levels from 0.02 to 0.04 percent. Venus's atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, and 90 times more massive than Earth's. Much like an Antarctic glacier traps even the slightest snowfall for hundreds of thousands of years, so Venus's atmosphere traps even the slightest heat, entombing it in its carbon dioxide sea. Venera 8 also reached the surface, and doubled its sister's survival time, lasting 50 minutes. It confirmed not only Venera 7's measurements, but also tasted Venus's surface, revealing it to be basaltic. It also showed that Venus's troposphere, the region where its clouds reside, is 65 kilometers high, four times the height of Earth's troposphere, and that the enveloping cloud layer begins at 35 kilometers above the surface, three times the cruising altitude for a jet airliner. If ever there was a time mankind could be said to have first gazed upon hell, it was when we gazed through the eyes of Venera 9. Her Soviet creators were too jaded at this point to expect a picture, 
So to downplay public expectation, they referred to her cameras as telephotometers and contrast meters. But on October 22, 1975, return an image Venera 9 did. The first complete image ever taken from the surface of an alien planet. And alien, it truly was. A vast field of black basaltic dust, paved with jagged broken slabs, their edges still sharp from lack of erosion, under a leaden sky rimmed with distant roiling clouds. It was a landscape forbidding in the truest sense, a cry of warning from the cosmos to humanity. You are not welcome here. Even the bleak deserts spanning our deepest ocean chasms were more hospitable to our intrusions than that blighted waste. Veneris 11 and 12 also successfully landed, but their cameras failed to open. Though blind, they could still hear, and what they heard has proven the most maddening of Venus's coquettish revelations. The series of ultra-low frequency sounds that resembled thunder, but thunder at a barraging frequency never heard on Earth. How this could be, with the nearest clouds 35 kilometers up, is still not known. And, in a very Russian poetic turn of phrase, the Venera team nicknamed the mystery the Electric Dragon of Venus. The U.S.'s pioneer Venus orbiter, which circled Venus from 1978 until 1992, could only offer tantalizing hints of lightning. Cassini, which detected a thousand flashes of lightning during its brief gravity-assist flyby of Earth, and would go on to detect lightning on Saturn, saw none at Venus. For a brief period in 2007, Venus Express appeared to confirm Venera's findings, not only that Venus had lightning, but on a scale dwarfing lightning on Earth. These detections remain the most persuasive evidence yet for lightning on Venus. Unfortunately, space is a very electrically active place, and there is nothing Venus Express saw that cannot be attributed to other sources. With that, and Japan's Akatsuki Venus orbiter hobbled after a faulty orbital insertion, it seems that the electric dragon of Venus is likely to remain unslain for some time to come. And then, in 1981, Veneris 13 and 14 finally captured what the Soviets had so far attempted and failed to see. A human eye's view of the surface of Venus. Despite landing on different parts of the planet, Veneris 13 and 14 both saw the same panorama as their sister 9. Unending plains of jagged black basaltic slabs scattered across the world like fallen tombstones, only now tinged by clouds the color of blood and fire. They were the last images ever taken from the surface of Venus. Venera 13 and 14 survived the longest of any Venus landers, between an hour and 90 minutes. Even the later Vega probes, arriving in 1985, wouldn't surpass them. But the Vegas didn't possess cameras, Apparently, after finally seeing Venus through human eyes, the Soviets no longer considered it worth the effort. Perhaps subjecting the Soviet people to an earthly image of hell was putting a strain on public relations. Unlike the Russians, Americans preferred to conduct their wooing from a distance. The first landform found on the surface of Venus was viewed from Earth via radar imaging. The so-called Maxwell Montes, named after James Clark Maxwell, whose equations made radar possible, were confirmed by the later Pioneer Venus probe as the highest point on Venus's surface, about 20% higher than Everest. Other nearby regions were named Alpha Regio and Beta Regio, meaning simply A region and B region. Giovanni Schiaparelli, these namers were not. Incidentally, they were also the last features on Venus not to be named for women as per IAU dictate, on the only planet named for a goddess, all features must have female names. Repeated Earth-based radar imaging of the surface between 1961 and 1969 was able to show that Venus rotated exceptionally slowly, 
243 days, which is longer than its 224 day year. This slow rotation means that Venus, unlike Earth, is almost perfectly spherical and does not bulge outward at the equator. More bizarrely still, Venus rotates backwards. If you could see the Sun from the surface of Venus, which you decidedly cannot, it would rise in the west and set in the east. The weird alchemy of rotation combined with a nearly identical year means that sunrise occurs twice every Venusian year, rather than once as you would expect. The slowness of Venus's rotation is relatively easy to explain. Much like Mercury, it has been tidally braked by its proximity to the Sun. Harder to explain is why Venus, alone among the terrestrial planets, rotates backwards, or, depending on your point of view, upside down. Did Venus simply slow down and then reverse its spin? Or did some monstrous force actually upend it? An impactor is an unlikely suspect. Any impact powerful enough to physically flip Venus on its axis would also be powerful enough to blow it apart. Current thought is that Venus owes its strange rotation to tidal drag from the Sun on its monstrous atmosphere, which, remember, is basically a global ocean. Earth's far less extensive ocean causes a similar, though less obvious, slowdown in Earth's rotation on an order of a second per century, thanks to tides from the Moon. Whether these tides merely slowed Venus's rotation into reverse, or were enough to completely flip it over, as some models have suggested, we still don't know. In 2012, Venus Express noticed that, to the absolute astonishment of observers back on Earth, the glacial rotation of Venus had actually slowed since the last time it was directly measured in the 1990s, by a full six and a half minutes, likely due to atmospheric drag. This is probably a cyclical phenomenon, much like Earth's atmosphere accelerates and decelerates its spin on the order of seconds per day. In 1973, Andrew Young, an astronomer at NASA, through spectrographic studies of Venus's clouds, was able to unravel her most devious deception. Those all-encompassing clouds were composed not of life-giving water, but of sulfuric acid. This was later confirmed by another of America's courtly lovers, the Pioneer Venus Probe, a combined orbiter and lander that took measurements of its atmospheric composition. It is very likely that, assuming that lightning does exist on Venus, rain does as well. However, sulfuric acid is too volatile to collect on Venus's surface, and so likely evaporates into the air, a phenomenon known on Earth as Virga. And that may not be the only, or even the strangest form, of Venusian precipitation. During its four-year stint around Venus, the Magellan probe noted that the tops of Venus's highest mountains appeared to be covered in a bright reflective substance similar to terrestrial snow. Except, of course, it couldn't possibly be. Could it? Just because Venus is too hot for water to evaporate, rise to higher altitudes, and then fall back as snow, doesn't mean some other substance couldn't do the same. Candidates for Venusian snow include such wintry favorites as lead sulfide, iron sulfide, also known as fool's gold, or elemental tellurium. The clouds of Venus have a 75% albedo, meaning they reflect about 75% of the light hitting them, close to that of fresh snow. It is because of this that any picture of Venus that you have likely seen is a lie. Even if it deigns to show Venus with her clouds on, they will either be in a non-visible wavelength such as ultraviolet, or with heightened contrast to enhance cloud patterns. In visible light and true color, Venus looks boring. A flat, matte white cue ball against the black of space. Careful examination could reveal a slight yellow tinge to the unending whiteness. And, since sulfuric acid is colorless, no one is entirely sure what causes it. Opinions range from ferric chloride to elemental sulfur, which would mean that Venus's clouds were in fact laced with brimstone. In 1962, America's first gentle letter to Venus, Pioneer 2, confirmed utterly and totally what had been suspected from Earth-based measurements. That Venus is hot because it's hot. Not only were its observed temperatures emanating from the surface, but the only other alternative a strong magnetic field, simply wasn't there. Today, we know Venus has no magnetic field to speak of. 
The reason for this is not known. In 2017, a multinational study suggested that the giant impact that gave the Earth its moon may also have kickstarted its magnetic field by stirring up the materials in its core. Since Venus has no moon, it likely suffered no such impact, and so its core remains stratified, like the water in a stagnant pond. In such a state, Venus's core could not convect, and so could not generate an intrinsic field. Today, thanks to ESA's Venus Express probe, we know that while Venus does not appear to have an intrinsic magnetic field, it does have an induced one, generated by particles in the upper atmosphere, ionized by solar ultraviolet radiation, manifesting as a deep green glow within its clouds, first recorded by Venus Express in 2014. And this in turn causes its upper atmosphere to escape into space, much like the tail of a comet. At Christmas 2006, Venus Express recorded a massive increase in atmospheric loss, which one team member described as, as if someone had driven a knife into the planet and bled it out. Unlike Mars, whose atmosphere has been all but stripped by the solar wind, Venus's combination of a higher gravity and likely active volcanism has allowed it to retain an atmosphere, despite lacking a magnetic field. America's longest dance with Venus is almost forgotten today, sandwiched as it is between the hell-conquering Venera probes and the more discerning Magellan probe. But the pioneer Venus orbiter was one of the most successful interplanetary probes ever launched, remaining in orbit around Venus for 14 years longer than Cassini was around Saturn. It was only deorbited in 1992, when its successor, Magellan, had already arrived. It comprised two separately launched craft, an orbiter and an atmospheric entry multiprobe that took samples of the clouds, confirming their sulfurous composition. One of Pioneer's most profound discoveries was that, while Venus's lower atmosphere barely moves at all, her upper atmosphere is an unending cycle of rage. Speeds regularly top 400 kilometers per hour, 60 times as fast as the planet's rotation, though still in the direction of rotation, and double the fastest jet streams on Earth. Driven, we now know, from the searing heat of the sun, which, thanks to Venus's slow rotation, cooks the upper atmosphere to a boil, sending its seething clouds racing to the cooler, relatively speaking, night side. And the rage is not subsiding. During its eight years of operation, Venus Express saw wind speeds increase from 300 to 400 kilometers an hour. The winds are strongest at the equator, gradually decreasing to nothing at the poles, creating great chevron-like patterns visible in the ultraviolet. The sun's blasting of the atmosphere creates massive convection cells that carry it toward the poles, where it plunges downward into vast whirlpools. For reasons still unknown, these whirlpools technically anti-cyclones, have two linked eyes. The thickness of Venus's atmosphere means that, as it pushes against variations in Venus's topography, such as mountains, the actions on the ground ripple into the upper atmosphere, where they are visible as great, fiery waves. Not only did Pioneer plumb the depths of the atmosphere, it also provided our first map of Venus's surface using cloud-penetrating radar albeit at 10 kilometer resolution. The resulting altimeter map was colored in familiar reds and blues, making Venus seem almost Earth-like. The topography of Venus even comprised landforms that looked suspiciously like islands and continents. The two largest were named, appropriately, Ishtar and Aphrodite. Ishtar in the north is the home of Maxwell Montes, while Aphrodite straddles the equator. A third, more vaguely defined landmass called Lada after the Slavic goddess of love, surrounds Venus's south pole. That homey illusion was shattered once Pioneer's successor, NASA's Magellan probe, finally arrived in 1990. With a resolution nearly ten times sharper than Pioneer, it was able, for the first time, to view individual geographic features on Venus's surface. Visions of hell have existed for as long as civilization. But all, however abstracted, have drawn inspiration from prior human experience. What confronted the Magellan team at Venus was truly otherworldly. Bizarre, fractured landforms that resemble nothing so much as the mark 
left from the punch of a primordial god. Strange, blister-like formations erupting from matte black plains. Rivers of lava thousands of kilometers long. Deformed objects that resemble imploded volcanoes. Many of these features had never been seen by human eyes, and remain, so far, unique to Venus. The surface of Venus is dominated by volcanoes. Over 1,600 of them, a record for any planet, loom over the vast lava plains that comprise most of Venus's land surface. Do not be fooled by the fiery reds and oranges used to mark Magellan's maps. Venus's lava-strewn surface is pitch black. What few dunes disrupt its basaltic plains more closely resemble those that form underwater on Earth. It had long been believed that Ishtar, Aphrodite, and Lada represented analogues to continents on Earth, and would play that role had Venus retained its water. However, Earth's continental crust is chemically very different from Venus's, which bears more resemblance to dense, basaltic oceanic crust. Even the oldest highlands, known as Tesserae, which date as far back as 750 million years ago, show evidence of layering, which granitic continental crust cannot do. It's possible that they may be the collided remains of a gigantic downwelling. This means that, although Venus's crust is likely about as thick as Earth's crust, between 100 and 200 kilometers, it is denser, as oceanic crust is. Most of Earth's surface features are the result of so-called tectonics, a system of broken plates that jostle against one another, crashing into, rubbing against, or overriding each other, in each case producing distinct geological forms. Faults like San Andreas, fold mountains like the Himalayas or the Alps, volcanic chains like the Andes. But Venus, despite being nearly the size of the Earth, reveals a surface all but utterly devoid of tectonic features. Venus's most distinctive features, the coronae, are believed to be blisters left over from volcanic upwelling that then partially collapsed as lava within them cooled. Venus's crust is almost certainly a strong, thick, single rind, often called a stagnant lid, the fire beneath only released through volcanism. Several regions on Venus betray features common to igneous provinces on Earth, gargantuan floods of basalt from supervolcanic eruptions lasting hundreds or thousands of years. At every level, from its atmosphere to its core, Venus is a world of buried, repressed fury. This fury was revealed most clearly by an unlikely informant, impact craters. On Earth, impact craters are rare, hidden, and often utterly deformed by the constant geological, chemical, and biological processes seen on our planet every day. On less active worlds, such as the Moon or Mars, craters are far more common and can reveal geological histories through their distribution. The most cratered regions are the oldest and least geologically altered, while the least cratered regions are young and potentially geologically active. Venus has a middling number of impact craters, 940, compared to 128 for Earth and 43,000 for Mars. Much of this is due to its atmosphere. Turns out it's not that easy to survive a trip through a blast furnace ocean laced with sulfuric acid. And indeed, no impact craters with a diameter smaller than 1.5 kilometers have been found. But it was their distribution that proved their most peculiar aspect. Venus's craters appeared completely random. There were no clusters of ancient weathered craters peeking out from under subsequent lava flows. No patterns of impact suggesting they suffered through the late heavy bombardment. In fact, the crater count suggested that no region of Venus could be older than about 750 million years. But if the impact craters were truly random, then no surface on Venus could be younger than that either. It was as if, 750 million years ago, every inch of Venus just spontaneously appeared at the same time. This has led to one of the most terrifying hypotheses ever proposed in planetary science. Global catastrophic resurfacing. Apparently, 750 million years ago, the stagnant lid entombing Venus's fiery core finally overboiled, transforming every inch of land beneath its clouds into an ocean of searing, seething lava. More reserve takes on the hypothesis suggest that the process may have been slower 
and more piecemeal, but the effect is the same. But if Venus had such a violently volcanic past, could it still be active today? Once again, Venus has kept her secrets close. During four years of observation, the Magellan probe saw no evidence of fresh volcanism, but there are several signs that Venus Express may have caught the planet in the act. When it first arrived in 2006, the spacecraft recorded a massive increase, and an equally drastic decrease, in the amount of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, suggesting a volcanic eruption. Data analysis after the craft had concluded its mission found several hot spots in the atmosphere that would rise and fall over the course of a few days. These hot spots coincided with a rift on Venus's surface called Geniki Chasma, likely a split caused by volcanic upwelling distending the surface. Similar hotspots, though not as intense, have been recorded over lava flows, suggesting they were only recently produced. Every element of Venus's history, at least as far back as we can read it, can be traced to one simple fact. Lack of water. The Venus's crust is a single plate stagnant lid, while Earth's crust is divided into active, mobile plates, is likely due to water weakening the crust enough for it to break. Its overwhelmingly basaltic makeup is likely because granite, the main component of continental crust on Earth, requires water to form. Even the presence of mountains on its surface is likely aided by a lack of water. Dry basalt is structurally stronger than wet basalt, and so Venus's mountains retain their shape even in the planet's kiln-like temperatures. And yes, that fact also explains Venus's fire trap atmosphere. It is widely believed that at the dawn of the solar system, Earth, Venus, and Mars had very similar atmospheres, just as Venus and Mars do today, at least compositionally speaking. But the presence of water on Earth meant that carbon dioxide dissolved into the oceans, before reacting with silicate rocks to form carbonates. This process gradually removed the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and only speeded up once plants began using it to make sugar, and microscopic organisms began using it to make shells. But that doesn't mean Venus never had water. One of the most striking discoveries of the Pioneer Venus probe is that, of the scattered wisps of water still left in Venus's atmosphere, the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium is 150 times higher than that on Earth. Deuterium is hydrogen with an extra neutron, and on Earth, water with deuterium instead of hydrogen, called heavy water, makes up about 156 molecules per 10,000 molecules of normal water. Being heavy, Heavy water evaporates less readily than ordinary water, so the higher the heavy water ratio, the more evaporation the water has undergone. The stratospheric levels of heavy water in Venus's atmosphere suggested that, one time, Venus would have had vastly more water than it does today. Perhaps an ocean's worth. This is possible because the Sun is believed to have been far fainter in its earliest years than it is now and Venus's locale in our solar system may once have been far more desirable. But, as the sun grew in strength, water began slowly to evaporate from Venus's surface. Water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, more so even than carbon dioxide, and as it built up, so the temperature increased. As water vapor made its way to the top of Venus's atmosphere, it would have been torn apart by solar radiation. Some will have combined with sulfur dioxide to form sulfuric acid, a tinier fraction still would have remained in the atmosphere, but most would have been carried away on the solar wind. In 2019, a series of simulations of possible Venusian oceans suggested a less apocalyptic history for the planet. Several models had the oceans surviving for more than three billion years, only dying out when the global resurfacing event boiled them away 750 million years ago. This may seem more pleasant, but it is a stark reminder of an inescapable fate. Right now, our world is, as Venus may have been, replete with water and life. But Venus is coming for us. Not literally, but as I said, the sun is getting brighter, by about 1% every hundred million years. And just as it got too bright for Venus, Soon, it will be too bright for our planet. In only a few billion years, the same tragedy that spelled doom for Venus will spell doom for Earth, and its fertile fields and cascading waters will be replaced by endless tracts 
of black basaltic slabs entombed in a fiery sea. A lonely end for a once blue planet. Well, fellow seekers, we have now come to the end of one of the more difficult videos I've made. I originally intended it to be my Halloween episode, but as you can see, it's now well past Halloween. I also intended to include the recent possible discovery of biosignatures in Venus's atmosphere, but I think, now that I've decided to stop here, that I may as well save that for my end of the year list. After all, bar the return of the star of Bethlehem come Yuletide, it will likely take the top spot. Instead, I think it's best to see this video as a preview for my next series, which will continue after the Water series on the seven classical planets. I had always intended to make this video, just not now. The others, I hope, will follow the same pattern. My next video will return to the Water series, and will be a picnic compared to my last few videos, mostly just browsing Wikipedia articles, some of which I wrote. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Hope you like it and see you soon. I'm going to sleep. Good night.